The most important thing about a mission is the patch. And the best patches are the ones that have your name on it. <laughs> now here is Endeavor. We've done this a couple times by now, so we've gotten really good at walking out. <laughs> and we're getting off the van, and believe it or not, we're saying this is the one day that we're not going to go. And you could see that uh, it's a little bit tight strapping in as we get uh, the pilot in there. And uh, you could see folks uh, on the mid deck, the flight deck crew. And now we're there for a couple of hours and finally we actually are getting the go as we uh, remove the white room. And this will kind of speak for itself. We're go for main engine start. We have main engine start. Four, three, two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff of Endeavor, completing Kibo and fulfilling Japan's hope for an out of this world space laboratory. Houston Endeavor, home program. Roger, roll Endeavor. The camera views we have now are just amazing. Always a great moment when the solids uh, separate. And uh, you can see here that we have main engine cutoff for Miko as we finally achieve uh, orbit and weightlessness. And what a great feeling for everybody. Here's a great shot that was taken by Chris Cassidy of the tank as we photograph that before it re-enters. Remember, it's the only part that uh, does not get reused. We open up the payload bay for the very first time, get our view of the planet out the back window at the same time that we see everything in our cargo bay. Here's a wonderful first view of, uh, of our beautiful Earth. And there's uh, Tim Copra, and there was uh, Tom Marshburn, Julie. Uh, folks uh, very quickly uh, getting ready to go to work, Doug Hurley. Uh, we haven't been up there very long. And after a couple days, it's time to go ahead and uh, find this thing called a space station. So fortunately, I, I didn't lose it. <laughs> Here's a great view of what we carry in our payload bay. This is uh, going to be the uh, exposed facility, the Jeff. That's the jelly we'll, we'll attach to it. We'll see it later. And this is something called the ICC integrated cargo carrier that has several payloads and batteries. I believe you could tell that this is just slightly sped up but uh, performed a valuable role for uh, this great photography of our underside to make sure that the team on the ground can determine that our vehicle was in a good condition for entry. Hard to believe that we actually did this. But uh, it was phenomenal. And here we are coming aboard. We're going to go ahead and dock right there on the space station. And as we come aboard, you'll see uh, some of the targets that we lined up. You have a crosshair right here that we use for visual alignment. And it's blurry here, but in the camera it tells you that uh, we're pretty much aligned. As we go ahead and open the hatch, and we have a very excited station crew of six on board waiting to welcome us. Let's take a tour of the International Space Station. It is absolutely huge. Here's a view from the commander window. We, see, we saw the Japanese module. That was the European module. Here's part of NASA's Node 2. And at the very top there, one of the Canadian uh, robotic element. So we go down. Oh, taking care of cables in weightlessness is not fun. We turn the corner into the shuttle airlock and then turn another corner into the space station. You have to do a bit of a 90 degree turn in order to realign yourself. This of course is a little sped up again. Here's Koichi Wakara that was really glad to see us because we were his ride home. This is the uh, European module 
Columbus, we turn around and we're seeing Bob Thursk inside the Japanese module with uh, which we worked extensively. And particularly there is a, a small uh, closet up there and a, two windows that are absolutely great. Watch. That's what you see. Unbelievable sight, especially when we had our space walkers out there. We could see them like if they were real close. We continue on through the node two and into the main lab, Destiny, the US lab. This is a, it looks like a closet, but it's actually a sleep station. Each crew member that stays on station for several months has a place to sleep and put their things. Tim Copra, who came up with us, is already exercising. There's Frank Devine from Belgium. We couldn't help it but to stop and look at the uh, robotics workstation because we were going to spend a lot of time there. Continue on, exiting the lab into node one, one of the first module that was brought in space in 1998. And here's a view of the airlock where our spacewalker were already busy taking care of their equipment. And now we're passing from the US part of the station into the Russian part. This was one of the Soyuz capsule to return to Earth. There's Roman Romanenko, one of the Russian crew member, through the FGB, a Russian cargo module, into another pathway to go to yet another Soyuz capsule. This is the vehicle that some of the station crew members take to return to Earth. There's the commander of station, Gennady Padalka from Russia, where he was doing an experiment. And this is the very tip of station. We'll turn around one last time so that you can see. It's the size of two football field from one end to the other. But we didn't have much time to explore. We had to go to work right away. First thing first, we had to install the expose facility, which of course was way too long for us to talk about. So we called it the Jeff, but really what it is, it's a expose facility, it's a port. In order to get it on station, we had to pick it up with one arm, pass it to the other, and then pick it up with the same arm that was used to pick it out of the cargo bay. Quite a complicated robotic ballet, which was devised by our almighty freight controllers and, and planners on the ground. This is extremely sped up. Um, <laughs> we don't operate big pieces this fast. So when it was properly aligned, and this was practiced on the ground several times, Doug Hurley and Koichi Wakata aligned it up and installed it, and here it was in its final position. It's still up there. Well, we had to do this kind of handoff of pieces of our cargo bay three more times in, uh, in the uh, mission. So we picked up a piece, we handed it off to the other arm and installed it on station. Here comes the jelly, which carried three Japanese payload that we would then use the Japanese arm, first time we would use it in an operational manner, to pick up those payloads that would be installed on the exposed facility to do science in the vacuum and space for months to come. We had three of those payloads, so we had teams. Our, each payload was done by a different team of robotic operator, and you see them right here, and install one at a time uh, over the course of one day onto the exposed facility. And here's the jelly empty. It then got picked up yet again by the big arm, given to the shuttle arm, and put back in the cargo bay to come back home with us. So in order to pull off five EVAs, we had a four people team, Tim, Dave, Tom, and myself. You can see on, uh, to make a flight day four EVA happen, which is a day after undock, there's a lot of equipment that needs to be transferred immediately. And that earlier picture was Dave doing just that. Getting the folks in the crew lock is no, no small task. They're two big, cumbersome guys in the suits, plus all the umbilicals. And routing those umbilicals so we don't uh, get all tangled up took us a, a, a few learning curves, but we, we, we got it. A lot of integrated robotics on this mission, which uh, 
which is very communications intensive, which we practiced for quite extensively on the ground. You can see Doug and Julie would drive Dave around on the arm, this here on EVA2, as he's going into position to grab some of the large ORUs uh, that will place to their storage platform on, on the station. Down here you can see Tom through Dave's helmet camera as Tom's getting in alignment to help uh, provide clearance views. This is the SCAN antenna which gave Dave nightmares prior to launch as he worried about that an uh, banging that antenna. Dave likes to say that he's happy he lives in the future where, where the antenna is in good shape, not the other future. <laughs> Here's Dave installing a pump module. This is an interesting piece of equipment because the, mo the module itself is larger than the platform that, uh, that it sits on. So it's difficult to see the alignment as he puts it in there. And it took a lot of coordination between Tom and Dave in order to pull that off. The next phase of the EVAs got into batteries. And here you can see two of us working with the batteries. They're uh, about five feet by five feet by two feet or so and weigh several hundred pounds. And uh, they actually move fairly well and stable once you get them out of, the, out of the, uh, their attachment spots. But they did require a significant amount of force. That force, which you can see, makes the arm oscillate. And that's what gave Julie and Doug their nightmares. So we would do a technique uh, called a shepherding or, or, or uh, handing it back and forth. This is, this is MLI. We heard earlier a group gave a, an award for that, and some, I'm sorry to those folks that I had to throw your MLI over, over, uh, overboard. <laughs> this is a view out the Japanese uh, window as, uh, on EVA 5 when Tom and I were out there uh, working on some cameras to install as well as um, prepare some handrails for later use. This is a view of the small camera that we installed. And you can see the safety tethers that we use strung along. And that's where you have to pay particular attention to uh, making sure those get, are straight and don't, don't get tangled. Well, it's hard work to work in a spacesuit, but it's easier inside where you aren't encumbered by that pressure suit. Living in space is an acquired, learned talent or art. Some people are better at it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> These guys are really good at it at this point. Julie's very good. Um, there are some collisions. You know, definitely don't try this at home. You, you, can lose, yeah, you can lose track of the ceiling and the floor. If you don't pay attention, it's kind of fun to do. Sometimes it feels like you're crawling up out of a manhole or diving straight down. Meals are a lot of fun. The, you, the pressure comes off. You hear lots of languages in this space station. It's very international. Uh, foods from many countries, music from many countries. It, it's really a, a very uh, interesting meeting ground between people and the discussions uh, and philosophy that is exchanged between the work is pretty fascinating. It, it definitely does bring the people from many countries together. It serves that purpose. The food is rehydrated. Kind of like camping food, it's extremely good. <laughs> That's pretty dangerous, Roman. <laughs> Roman had his specialty uh, breakfast tacos there. They're, they're glued together with taco sauce <laughs> and eggs. And you got to get the mi mixture just right. You have to maintain this space station and spacecraft just like any other home. Uh, I hear you vacuum at home. <laughs> <laughs> Doug. Doug, please. Okay, the uh, end of the docked phase of the mission, saying goodbye was uh, hard because we uh, had a great time with all our friends, but uh, we felt like we had accomplished everything we set out to do, and here we go. Mark gave me the keys to Endeavor, and I got to do uh, the undock and fly around. Some of the most incredible views I've ever seen in my life. You can see the shadow of Endeavor there in the solar arrays. Uh, 
obviously slightly sped up. Not a lot, though. I flew it pretty fast. <laughs> There's a view from uh, Space Station of us doing our fly around. We actually did not feel we'd had enough to do on this mission, so we uh, were able, on the day before we came home, to deploy a couple of satellites. That satellite was actually designed and built by uh, graduate students from Texas A&M and University of Texas together. This is a Navy satellite we also deployed. Uh, it actually was supposed to come apart, as you see here. <laughs> and uh, it was good that we had studied up on that so we knew what to expect. There's another satellite that's about to come out of the canister there. And it offered uh, just wonderful views as, as well as uh, some good tracking and data for the, for the investigators as well. And you could really see orbital mechanics in work there. It was a beautiful sight. Uh, the uh, mid-deck team put together a great uh, deorbit plan for us. Here we are on uh, landing day. I got to join the flight deck crew for the landing. We're all very excited about uh, coming home at this point. That's tendrils of plasma that are coming up over the uh, overhead windows, about 3,000 degrees on the outside of the orbiter at that point. We're just starting to feel uh, the beginnings of uh, any acceleration, some Gs. There's Roman demonstrating that with one of his cue cards. Uh, as you, I think, I thought we were experiencing about 10 Gs, and Roman said, okay, there's 0.1 G now. <laughs> and uh, it really, really hits you pretty hard, but it's, it's very fascinating. The uh, re-entry is very fast. It seemed it was seconds between Central America, Cuba, and then suddenly over Florida. You know, all commanders say that they uh, fly some pretty good uh, landings, but if you ever really want to know, just talk to the mid-deck crew and the, the rest of the crew. And I'll have to say that no one actually knew that we had touched the ground. It was such a smooth landing. And our families were very happy to see us come home. We were happy to be able to see them here pretty soon. And then finally, we had a chance to uh, walk out and uh, see our orbiter. Everybody was uh, feeling remarkably well. I think every now and then I needed a little help uh, to make sure I was standing up straight. There's Chunky helping me out a little bit. <laughs> but uh, everybody was looking real good. And so again, uh, thank you to everyone. That's our uh, video presentation tonight. <laughs>